this on? Can you hear me? Whatever you want to do. Okay. I'm going to get a crick in my neck, I'll I think. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So we're about ready to move on to our second panel, and I wanted to sort of point out the order of all of this. You know, the first panel was really intended to talk at a very general level about, about computing and IT talent and what companies and, and workforce um, experts are seeing in the space more broadly. Now we're going to turn our attention to a particular sector, that being national security, because I think it really informs us if we look at the different industry verticals and see what kinds of things they see as well. And certainly I think we should all care about national security as being an important uh, sector for us all. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Carnes, who is the moderator of our session. Kelly? Thank you, Lucy. Thanks so much for holding this. A really interesting discussion on the first panel this morning. Um, I'm here today to both moderate and also to speak about um, the Navy's STEM to Stern initiative which is the Navy's One Navy approach to STEM. And I, along with several other um, consultants, support that and spend quite a bit of time um, doing that. So um, let me begin by introducing all the panelists today in the order that we're going to have everyone speak. I'm going to kick off with a couple of minutes on what the Navy is doing. And then I'm going to move to Robin Williams, who's the Director for National Cybersecurity Education and Workforce Development at the Department of Homeland Security. He's going to give a, a perspective on a specific issue of critical need cybersecurity and from a, um, a different non-defense agency, but an agency involved in national security. Um, Robin is the Director of National Cybersecurity Education and Workforce Development, and his office is responsible for development of national cybersecurity education policy, standards, and assessment requirements for federal, state, local, tribal, and private sector cybersecurity professionals. And he executes two components of the President's National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, known as NICE. I liked that acronym. Um, he spent 22 years in government service, including 20 years in the United States Air Force, so he can also bring perspectives from the Air Force as well, and um, retired as a lieutenant colonel, and he earned his bachelor's degree from Minnesota State University, Moorhead, in 1989, and a master's degree from Louisiana Tech in 1998. And following Robin, we're going to turn to our um, third representative on um, military programs, who is Laura Dolphy the Director for STEM Development Office, Research Directorate, Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Um, Laura is the Director of the STEM Development Office there. She um, leads the office that was created to facilitate and coordinate the department's STEM investments. She was responsible for guiding the development of the first STEM Education and Outreach Strategic Plan that was submitted to Congress in May 2010. And she has a background in health and education and has done a lot of work in developing research and education portfolios for many federal agencies. She also served as a professional staff member of the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee. And her research interests center on career development of individuals underrepresented in STEM. And then once we have the presentations on the Navy, the Department of Homeland Security, and then the work defense-wide from Laura, we're going to turn to the private sector per perspective. And with that, we will lead off with Susan Lavrakis, the Director of Workforce Aerospace Industries Association. Um, the AIA has been extremely active in these issues and has done a lot of really great work over the last couple of years. Um, Laura has had a 40-year professional career in national security affairs. Susan. 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 <laughs> Excuse me. Susan, chairing the AIA Industrial Base and Workforce Committee since 2007 and a member of the AIA Workforce Steering Committee from its founding in 2009. At the same time, she served as Vice President for Legislative Liaison in the Workforce Division of the National Defense Industrial Association and worked almost 20 years prior to that at Northrop Grumman before joining the government team at BAE Systems. And she also has studied political science and international affairs 
worked at the CIA and received her graduate degree from the University of Southern California. So we'll have a lot of perspectives represented by Susan as well. Um, and then finally, batting cleanup is going to be another private sector perspective from Matt Fusa, who's the legal director, Latin American region for Cisco Systems. Matt currently serves in this position, managing a team of lawyers throughout Latin America. He's an alumni of the Woodrow Wilson Public Policy Scholarship from September to November 2010, studying cybersecurity policy. Um, and he served as a judge advocate in the U.S. Marine Corps since 1994, specializing in international and operational law and the law of armed conflict. Um, his expertise includes export control laws, federal procurement law, and issues surrounding international business transactions and technology collaboration. So we have, have some representation from most of uh, the parts of the Department of Defense, at least in prior um, roles, if not uh, currently. With that, let me put my um, stem to stern hat on and spend a couple of minutes talking about the Navy's approach to uh, STEM and the issues that are being discussed here today. Um, the first thing is I found the discussion this morning very interesting about what some of the occupations are and which ones are in higher demand and how some of that shakes out. One of the first things that the Navy did was try to come up with a definition of STEM. And um, we spent a lot of time sifting through the National Science Foundation definitions, which I was surprised when I started doing STEM issues 15 or 20 years ago, I was surprised to learn that political scientists, of which I am one, are part of the STEM workforce. <laughs> However, there is no shortage of political scientists. So, <laughs> so the Navy has excluded social scientists, not because they don't hire social scientists and have them in a lot of important positions within the Navy, but because they're really not one of the key professions that they feel like the future of the Navy's ability to perform its mission hinges upon. Um, same for biological scientists. Uh, again, there are a lot of biological scientists involved in Navy positions, but those are given less priority and emphasis than the ones in physical sciences, computer sciences, engineering, and mathematics. That's really sort of the core of the effort. Um, engineers, are the foundation of the military warfare centers. I think it's probably true of the other services. There are um, many thousands of them employed not only directly by the laboratories and work for warfare centers, but also throughout the defense industrial base. Um, there are many thousands of computer scientists and those who may not have formal computer science training and degrees in computer science, but who have um, very much needed skills in information technology. Um, a key issue for the military is the requirement for national security reasons to rely very heavily on American citizens. And this means that in certain critical occupations, there are more challenges than in, in other occupations in recruiting, developing, retaining the workforce that's needed. Some of the areas that are of particular concern would include um, PhDs in engineering, computer science, mathematics. Um, the population of individuals who are earning PhDs in those disciplines is over 50 percent foreign students in each of those. And um, in engineering, I think it's 57 percent. So that means there's a much smaller pool of those candidates that can be attracted to work for the Navy. Um, physical sciences, the foreign population of uh, doctoral students in um, doctoral degree earners is not as heavily foreign, but it's kind of close behind, sort of in the high 30s to, to 40 percent. Um, in addition, the Navy has to focus on pretty much unique skill requirements in certain areas. Each of the services has its own responsibility skills. And in the Navy, these skills include a discipline such as naval architects, undersea weapons, um, acoustics, and some other occupations that 
um, maybe not as many other employers are training for. So those are areas of particular concern. Um, in addition, the Navy, just like I think the other services, has a serious issue with um, the aging of its workforce. Uh, there is a pretty su significant portion of the workforce that is or will become retirement eligible within the next decade. Um, in addition, I, the military has to focus on competition with the private sector. And in some cases, there are salary differentials that make working for the Navy perhaps less attractive than um, a private sector employer. Um, so for all these reasons, the Navy has made STEM a very high priority. And this is true from um, Secretary Mabus on down throughout the Naval leadership. Um, about two years ago now, the Navy launched for really the first time in history a coordinated approach to STEM. Previously, the Navy had had a sort of let a thousand flowers bloom kind of approach and a lot of activities at its laboratories and warfare centers that weren't um, necessarily even in communication with each other and weren't collaborating as much as they could be and leveraging resources. So one of the goals of the STEM to Stern initiative was to create a one Navy approach and to try to encourage collaboration and cooperation as much as possible across the naval enterprise. Um, Secretary Mabus has committed to double the Navy STEM investments over the next five years. Um, in fiscal 10, that is off of a base of about $54 million in investments, as well as um, the Navy, like the other services, has the benefit of about $20 million or has had in the past that is contributed directly by the Office of Se Secretary of Defense in some of the programs that they manage um, and uh, are responsible for. Uh, the vast majority of the direct Navy funding goes to higher education at this point. They have a lot of programs that deal with internships, research fellowships, and um, a very strong focus on trying to ensure that they're attracting the kinds of students and talent that the laboratories and warfare centers have defined that they need and then with an idea that those individuals can be recruited into um, positions within the Navy. Um, in addition, there, there have traditionally been a few signature initiatives in the K through 12 arena that are designed primarily to inspire students' interest in science and technology. Um, the Navy also has invested in um, nationally recognized programs such as FIRST, for example, and sponsoring a lot of teams in FIRST competitions has also had an emphasis on um, a program developed uh, within the Navy, which is Sea Perch, which is an undersea robotics competition <coughs> that is available for students um, of all ages. Um, the K through 12 portfolio has gotten a lot of thinking and emphasis within the last couple of years. There's a real concern of, with some of the data that has been presented. Um, the Business Higher Education Forum, for example, has done a study that says that only 16% of high school seniors are both interested in STEM and then have the necessary math and science background to be successful at a STEM degree in college. So that's a very, very small pool. Um, so what, what has gotten a lot of attention from the naval leadership is a way to expand programming that is longer duration, more hands-on, more mentoring, and um, activities that can really not only get students excited about science and technology, but um, engaged and keep them on a path of engagement until they kind of get old enough to begin to take advantage of some of the internships and scholarships and other um, pathways that allow them to come into the services over the long run. There's also been a huge focus on diversity, both in recruiting girls into some of these programs. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the statistics. There are about 20% of the engineering bachelor's degrees that are earned in the United States each year are earned by women, but only about 9% of women are actually working engineers. So how do you um, 
attract the ones that decide to stay into engineering and then also um, reduce the leakage there. Um, a big focus on reaching out to urban kids and economically disadvantaged kids, which have not been traditional groups that the uh, Navy has reached out to. And then two final things I'll just say briefly. A big focus on educational technology. The Navy has invested many hundreds of millions of dollars in developing um, digital tutors and other kinds of training tools that are at work with sailors and Marines in the field. And they have really successful results showing that individuals who are trained using these digital tutors perform better on tests, perform better in their jobs than um, soldiers and Marines that are trained in more traditional methods. And there's a very strong desire to take that body of knowledge and learning and all those tools and to figure out how to apply it uh, more broadly to STEM. Um, and then finally, there's a really strong interest in collaboration. And uh, one of the things that the Navy has done is sponsored a STEM forum in June where we brought together about 700 stakeholders. That wasn't the beginning of a conversation. It, uh, the conversation has been going on for about 18 months now. But the, the notion of having a dialogue, so many people in this room and so many people who've been fol following STEM have been working in their own areas many with great results, small programs, pilots. So to begin to think about how you can collaborate across all the best models, how organizations can work best together, how um, you can leverage resources and expand reach and impact has been another major area of focus and will continue to be. All right, so with that background, let me turn then to Robin for a different perspective from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, good, e or good afternoon, almost, I guess, in a few minutes, uh, good slash late morning. Um, I am actually the head cat herder for the nation's uh, cybersecurity workforce. And, uh, and it's exactly, that's exactly what I do. I am no kidding the head cat herder because I'm trying to build a coalition of the willing out there to, with the focus ultimately of targeting the, uh, the able but unwilling to create what we refer to as the able and the willing, okay, to join uh, the cybersecurity profession. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things. I was asked to first kind of talk about security clearance and those types of issues that we face in this, which was just alluded to a second ago. And then I'm going to talk about NICE. Okay, so I'm going to ask a couple questions first. First of all, how many people, from a background perspective, how many academias are here who'd call themselves academias? Okay, how many business... Uh, private industry folks are here, okay? How many practitioners of IT are here? Okay, a couple, a few, okay, okay. So we kind of got a mixture. Okay, how many, how many technocrats are here? A technocrat <laughs> is a non-technical IT person who sits in Washington, D.C. and decides on policy. Ah, one of me too, okay, great. <laughs> Technocrats. So I want you guys to remember that term that you are technocrats. Ask if there are any techno peasants. Techno peasants. Oh, that's that, that's a that's a that's a good one too. Techno peasants. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, that kind of te kind of to give you kind of give you the framework. First of all, uh, within the cybersecurity profession, and especially with working within the defense industrial base within the uh, within the USG itself, one of our largest limitations, of course, is the requirement for security clearances. How many here in this room have a clearance or had a clearance in the past? A few of you, okay. So the pain of having a TSSCI clearance and the cost it, to, to get a TSSCI clearance uh, is, is, an, is an, a great demand on resources. And with a clearance, of course, your market value drastically increases, especially if you want to work inside the beltway and you want to put up with traffic and everything like that. Uh, the, the biggest issue right now, and we're talking about, you were talking about STEM, and you heard the numbers about the problem that we face is we need U.S. citizens. That's the first major requirement. 
And when you have 57% of the U.S., of, of, the, of the STEM-educated folks out there uh, are not from the United States, you know, or foreign nationals, okay, now we've chopped, we've took a big chunk out of the possibility of getting somebody into, uh, into the defense industrial base or the U.S. government in a job that requires a clearance. Uh, people, you, and then, then you have the problem with U.S. citizens eliminating themselves in the process, uh, i.e. foreign contacts, relationships with foreign nationals, involvement perhaps even on Facebook with organizations that are considered subversive or things like that. Uh, and then um, financial problems, okay? We're, now we're in this big problem where so many Americans have had some type of credit issue or foreclosure or filed for bankruptcy. That, is an, that eliminates people right there. So, so you we're facing these challenges all the time. Uh, and then, unfortunately, we have a... Uh, I asked my friends over at that lovely agency in called Langley uh, the other day, I said, how are you going to recruit the covert operatives of the future? And they're like, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> well, considering that Facebook has organizations out there that are running facial recognition programs on people, uh, so is, so you hire a new agent, and what they're going to have to do in go in and get the t t faces faces off the John Travolta, Nick uh, Nicholas Cage movie type, replace somebody else's face with somebody else, so they can actually conduct operation. I mean, that's a serious issue that's coming up, and we have then we have people, you know, and the and the fact of social networking where people are just there's just so much information out there on you or your children and stuff like that that I have black you know. Opportunities for blackmail and 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 maybe turning somebody into an insider threat uh, is, is just rapidly expanding tremendously, just because of the fact that we're so interconnected and I can gather information now. So it's something you want to put in the back of your mind as you're you're as you're educating people, or you're talking to people, or you're out there engaging with people who want to pursue this career field. That these kids and stuff need to really think about this. Uh, there are some pilot programs out there that are working. NSA has one, for example, uh, that helps people, you know, even from the time they're a fifth grader. If they want to ever get a security clearance, these are the things you need to do as a fifth grader. Whoa. Okay, so just to give you an idea, it's called Project Scope. So if you can Google it, you, you do Project Scope. Uh, and you Google it, you'll find the information. And, and they have a packet you can download. You can give it to your fifth grader. And you tell them this is how you're supposed to behave yourself if you want a security clearance. Um, and also the problem is it's a long process. You've heard about the backlogs of security clearances and everything like that. Uh, from a numbers perspective, just the DOD themselves uh, are now processing between reinvestigations and initial investigations about 1.6 million investigations annually. And that's up from 10 years ago when it was about 350,000 a year or 325,000, somewhere around there. So you've got a, you've had a, you've had a, it's, it's tripled uh, in the, or more than tripled actually, uh, five times as many uh, over the last, uh, uh, last uh, uh, 10 years or so. Um, and another thing, and you let's take this down to the state and local level and things like that, with uh, the loss of, you know, some, we're trying to in, integrate, especially the, from the U.S. CERT perspective at, at Homeland Security, in order to defend networks, people have to have some clearances. And so you're dealing even down at the state and local level of trying to get people cleared to gain access to relevant intel to, to protect networks. So those are, uh, those are some of the, the key things with regard to security clearance. Now I want to take a, just a few minutes and talk about NICE. I heard people laughing or giggling in there. How many people have actually heard of NICE? Okay, a few. Okay. NICE is the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. It's a Obama administration initiative to professionalize and raise the bar of our cybersecurity workforce across the country. It has four unique components to it. Uh, component number one is a general awareness component that is run by DHS. It is the, how many people have heard the Stop, Think, uh, Connect campaign? And how many people here realize that this is Cybersecurity Awareness Month? 
Okay, so we're, we're having a message issue problem here. Okay. Okay. So my strategic communication plan needs to be reworked. I started, I took this job over three weeks ago. So I, I, give, me, give me a few, give me a couple more weeks and I'll have the whole nation on board. Uh, so uh, component number two of that is the formal education side of the house. And that's the targeting of the STEM K through uh, 20, uh, 22, 20, well, in my case, my kids, 25, uh, program to get everybody through college uh, and everything like that uh, and increase the numbers of folks uh, that are entering uh, into the cybersecurity profession. And like I talked about before, one and two are particularly targeting what I described as the able but unwilling to create able and willing. Uh, participants in cybersecurity. Uh, component number three is the workforce structure, which targets the federal, state, and local in, in working closely with is a DHS OPM effort to actually build the career path, okay, and look at the requirements and the initial training and what, what are we looking for out of the formal education system to having the, for these folks to en actually enter the work fit, uh, place. Then uh, component number four, which is, I believe, is perhaps the most critical component, is the professionalization and workforce development structure. Okay, uh, if you go to the, if you just Google Nice and go to the website, it's uh, Nice itself is is actually Dr. Ernest McDuffie at NIST is the national lead for Nice. Okay. Uh, on their website, you can see, get, gather all the information. Well, on the very front page of that website is the framework, which is this book that I'm holding right here. Okay, this is our. This is the. We're actually have we're starting to put together a solution to this problem. And one of the major issues with cybersecurity is the fact that there's really no path to take you from what I refer to as from hire to retire. And I think that's one of the things that's lacking and, and, all, and also uh, in discouraging people from actually entering the career force. Because they, they, I, think they, I think there's this perception that if you're not an uber geek, you can't enter the career force. Okay? And then because you're an uber geek, you can't do anything but be an uber geek. And how many CEOs are uber geeks? Right? How many people rise up to the top? So this, this is a path that basically takes you through what we refer to as the 31 flavors. It's the Baskin and Robbins thing. There are actually 31 functional roles that have been determined within cybersecurity. And this is the framework uh, that takes you, uh, that, that, that kind of guides you through what are the roles, what are these people called across the entire nation, and what the workforce looks like. And there's going to be an attached training compendium that is going to link training opportunities to what the government, and I'm using a government term here, KSA, knowledge, skill, and ability, that actually says, okay, if you enter the four levels, which basically are novice, if you want to use, if you want to use plumber terms, a novice, uh, apprentice, journeyman, and master, how do you move up that career, career path and to gain that technical expertise and then how do you broaden yourself across the entire information technology domain to ultimately end up being the CIO of, of a company or even the CEO with that background or the chief uh, technology officer, whatever you want to call it, to get you up the chain uh, and guide you through your career. What we've seen thus far is people in cybersecurity tend to transition and move from one organization to another because that's the only way they can feel they can have opportunities to move up the chain. Because no company has a, has a real plan out there that takes you from hire to retire. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the major things that are lacking. As part of that process and everything like that, we are engaged. Uh, now, we're not trying to do the Department of Education's job. So we're leaving the classroom curriculum to them, but we're trying to inspire uh, kids to, to become part of it and, and go into those curriculums. So uh, we are actually doing a separate kind of engagement, ish, engagement process with the Cyber, Cyber Innovation Center in Bossier City, Louisiana. Uh, and you can Google them uh, if you'd like to. Uh, the Cyber uh, Innovation Center in Bossier City has developed a program which we are helping fund 
uh, to bring in teachers and students together at the high school level in coordination with the local community college or four-year institution to help them uh, learn the skills they need as high school teachers to get people involved in cybersecurity education and do something like they're fo kind of what they're doing in, Wis in Wisconsin, do that leading edge type stuff. Well, at that time, when they're bringing with the students and everybody and the teacher together, uh, they're going through this summer camp, boot camp basically is what it is. And then the students leave and the teachers stay a little longer and they get some more in-depth curriculum. Well, the best part about this is we then give their school 70, a $7,500 check to go out and buy the equipment that they need to take this back to the classroom. And that's one of the, because right now, as every one of you guys know, at the secondary education level, most of those teachers are actually buying their own supplies in the classroom out of their own uh, awesome salary that they're getting paid every year. You know, that 125 k a year that our high school teachers are making? Yeah, that type of stuff. So, so those are those are some of the efforts that are going on out there, and I'm going to turn over here because I'm I'm way over I'm probably three or four minutes over time. So, but uh, please visit the nice website, become involved. Uh, uh, the Stop Think Can uh, Connect campaign link is on there also. Uh, uh, become a partner. Uh, there's materials out there that you can actually take to your community, uh, and. Uh, and, and give to teachers or stand up at a PTA meeting or whatever. Uh, this is a national problem and uh, it, it, it's gonna involve everybody to uh, participate in it. So I'll turn it over there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not bad for three weeks on the job. Um, <laughs> next up we have Laura Dolphy. She might describe her job as cat herder as well because she's in charge of bringing all the components of the defense enterprise together around a single strategy. Actually, um, I describe my job as putting socks on an octopus. <laughs> um, and actually, as I tell people, I was 6'5 when I started. <laughs> right? Uh, and I'm not down to about 5'2. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I apologize for not being able to uh, come here this morning and listen to the other panels. I was very anxious to do that, but... You know, couldn't get all the socks on the octopus, so uh, I, I spent my morning doing something else. Uh, just to sort of leverage off of what Kelly mentioned and Robin mentioned, and I don't know, I've also been at the Department of Homeland Security as well. I have a very checkered past. Um, I won't hold that against you. <laughs> just the way it is. Um, I'm going to just mention to all of you some of the sort of higher level activities the department's engaged in. I, I'm not sure, and I apologize if I'm repeating things, but um, the Department of Defense, along with 12 other federal agencies, are currently participating in the Committee on STEM Education. This is a, a group that is headed up by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So the idea uh, with this group is, you know, oops, I apologize, uh, <laughs> is to bring um, everybody together to basically do at a much larger level what we're trying to do at the department, which is to coordinate activities, to understand investments, to, you know, connect people so that we can leverage and be more effective with the taxpayers' dollars. Uh, that's just one of the, the issues that comes up with regard to coordinating. Um, but it's right not to be so duplicative and um, anyway that process is sort of winding down in that we've come up with an inventory of uh, the 12 agencies and uh, the department, uh, or I guess OSTP was supposed to release it although I don't recall whether that was released but I think at the end of the month, uh, last month it was going to be released so I can check on that but that would be obviously available to others so you could see across all the agencies uh, what things you know we're working on and inve investments we're making uh, then at the department level uh, as Kelly mentioned you know she's engaged in stem to stern each one of the um, other services Air Force and Army also have their own stem efforts now um, here's where things get tricky my job, it's really the department is 
pretty much all inclusive. So if you think about any other department in the federal government, I guarantee you there's one person that I have that does sort of the mission of that other agency. A lot of people don't know, you know, we have uh, veterinarians, right? Uh, we had food inspectors. So, as I say, you just think about all the other departments. So we're like a little, I describe us as like a Vatican, right? We're, we're our own little city. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, students in particular, parents think, okay, well, you're in the, you know, bullets, bombs, and guns business. Uh, but actually, you know, that's just a piece of what the big mission is. So we do have scientists and engineers all across the gamut. So while the Office of Naval Research or the Department of Navy is not counting social scientists as one example, at the department level we are. They're very, very important in uh, the Army. They're important to human systems, human performance research. And uh, just as an example, between 2008 and 2010, just social scientists alone, our workforce grew by almost 17.8 percent, I think it was. So that's pretty significant. So in addition to sort of coordinating the services and coming up with this very broad definition of STEM, it's understanding not just what those majors might be, the STEM majors, but it's also what are the STEM occupations, both for the civilian and the military. In addition to that, STEM supported. So as an example, technicians, even welders would be very important. Um, I think the Navy does count welders, actually. Um, so just having a broad understanding and then once we, and that's the job of my office, figure out what is it that we have, then we're going to start connecting what do we really need right in the future. And IT is one of those critical areas. Um, I, our workforce, just in the civilian for IT, is 4.4 percent. You think, oh, that's not very much, until you figure out, oh, okay, we're talking about 35,000 people, right? That's just in the IT category. Civilian only. That doesn't count the people in military. We have about 2.5 million in military all. And, and so what percentage, we're trying to understand what percentage of those individuals are IT managers or specialists or, you know, technicians, computer specialists. So uh, now moving on so to uh, different areas. So it's understanding as uh, Kelly mentioned those critical areas. So while we'll think of STEM very broadly, again, linking them to our s and priority needs, one of which is cyber, uh, we're then going to, you know, sort of drill down and understand what is the institutional capacity, right, to, if you will, developing this talent we need. Uh, and then in addition to that, what is the defense industrial base need as well? And how can we collaborate with individuals like Susan's organization uh, so that we can work in tandem uh, because rather than in competition, which is part of the problem the Department of Defense has. There are obviously needs for clearable citizens, but we're going to have to be a little more creative. As an example, uh, the department uh, launched a pilot for um, accelerating citizenship for physicians. This is a common thing that's done in the military, which you might not know that, right? So we do have non-U.S. citizens serving in the military, and assuming things work out, you know, we, we help accelerate their citizenship. So we're looking at all types of ways that we can draw, f you know, from a pool of talent. Um, Mr. Lemnios, who's the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, has created this executive, uh, a STEM executive board, for lack of a better thing uh, to call it, and uh, they're looking at education, training, and outreach aspects. You know, while we'll, we'll support, continue to support scholarships and fellowships, we still are, right, then what do you do, right? Your education's really not over, so you ha you ha the training piece is critical to connect with that, especially in IT. Uh, those skills have to continually be updated. Uh, how will we do that? Uh, what, you know, what mechanisms will we uh, use? And uh, although I didn't mention it, some of the investments that the department's made, Kelly uh, talked a little bit about, you know, what Navy's doing. We have, in addition to all of what 
Kelly talked about, just in the Navy alone, across the department, we have hundreds. And it goes all the way from pre-K, Robin, not fifth grade, pre-K, <laughs> all the way to early career researchers and trying to <coughs> it, provide the uh, interventions, as we call them in education, you know, uh, and make sure that when we uh, tap somebody in one place, if they're excited about it and they want more, that we're going to give them more, right, more opportunities to stay engaged. Um, we have, I don't think I mentioned this uh, specifically, but the department has a, in civilian workforce, 102,200 scientists and engineers. We are, Kelly mentioned this, you know, it's an aging workforce for sure. The Department of Defense has probably got the oldest workforce <laughs> in the federal government. Um, part of that, though, is the Department of Energy also has about 100,000 scientists and engineers. This is, this is one of the challenges for the Department of Defense. Ours are federal employees. The Department of Energy's are primarily contractors, so it's counted differently. So our federal and scientists and engineers have to, they are, um, if you will, put in these occupational codes, which makes us a little less flexible and adaptable. And uh, it's a, you know, it's a challenge, right, we, we work with. Um, but that is a consideration in information technology as an example. Uh, you know, how is it, uh, this is, and this is where we have to, you know, try not to think competition, but with industry, right? They think about it very differently. Um, some of our occupations require degrees. Uh, for the same occupation in industry, they may not require degrees, just experience and demonstration of, of uh, knowledge and skills. So that's our world. Uh, we are looking for priority STEM capable, right? We're looking for diversity and diversity not as a sort of secondary thought, but while we're looking, you know, to build the capabilities for our, our workforce to ensure that it is diverse, uh, the <coughs> department does pretty well with women, uh, uh, you know, not perfect, right? We're not totally equitable, but there are about 44% of women, in, you know, in the U.S. workforce, take her, you know, leave a percent or two. And in the department, we have about 35%. We do very well with women undergraduates in computer science. Not so well, you know, in the master's and the Ph.D. level. So, you know, we're looking at that. Um, but our other challenge is sort of the third priority is to invest in developing global scientists and engineers. And so it, we are looking to partner with the National Security Education Program as just one example. Uh, and uh, they actually fund individuals to get um, experience in languages and so what we understand in STEM in particular is that in order to be global right you have to understand the culture and the way people do science and engineering in other countries so that's about it for me um, I think I've sort of touched all the high points thank Thanks. you very much for the opportunity thank you Laura. all right now we're going to turn to Susan for a presentation on the view from the aerospace industry. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here, but I've got to tell you at this point in the morning, it's hard to strike any new chords because as you will understand, being that the Department of Defense, De Department of the Navy and Homeland Security are major customers of ours, you won't be surprised to know that we have very similar perspectives and experience and, <laughs> and we're working closely together. So I guess that's part of the key message. So I'll try to stay more focused and see if I can't move through this pretty quickly. For those of you who don't know, the Aerospace Industries Association was founded in 19 1919, shortly after the first flight, and um, we are the premier trade association for the aerospace and defense manufacturers. We at present time have more than 350 member companies. That includes all the major corporations whose names you would recognize and a lot of smaller suppliers uh, who, who provide the equipment that goes on, on our, our the the products that we produce. Our member companies uh, comprise every high technology manufacturing segment of the aerospace and defense industry from commercial aviation and avionics to manned and unmanned defense systems to space technologies and satellite communications. So 
it's obvious why we have a big stake in STEM education, STEM workforce preparation. Uh, we actually got real active on this. You're making reference to what AI has done the last few years. We responded to the Rising Above the Gathering Storm report. So in 2006, our CEOs said, how can it be that we've been investing so much money, so many, we have so many programs and so many of our people involved in, in supporting STEM education in various ways, and we're obviously not having an impact because if we were, we wouldn't be in the condition we are as far as uh, achievement in math and science in this country and the number of young people that are going into those fields. So they created a workforce committee, which is actually how I personally got exposed to this issue. A number of our companies were asked to send representatives to explore what are the best practices that we can share with each other that our companies are already involved in that we could perhaps take to national scale. They asked us also to reach out to everybody else who was working in this space, so academia, government, other, other organizations, the philanthropic community, to say how can we all figure out a better way to do this together because we recognized that we couldn't sh uh, solve the problem for our own industries without really solving it for the nation, nor would we want to do it alone. So that's how our committee got going. We immediately, at the um, encouragement of our CEOs, created a joint effort with the National Defense Industrial Association. So we've been holding joint meetings around the country for the last several years. And we started doing that to inform ourselves what our companies were already involved in. You know, as I said, we were asked to identify best practices. And along the line, we discovered that there were a lot of folks who were already working on creating STEM networks in given states and identifying how they could get all the different stakeholders together at, to create a community of practice. So we thought rather than our doing something separate, we should help combine with that effort. So now AIA and NDIA, when we go into a particular location and we hold four meetings a year in different parts of the country, we reach out to that local emerging STEM network and bring our member companies, our local representatives and member companies to the table with those conversations, hoping to create more synergies, less redundancy, more alignment at the state and local level. So that's a big part of what we've been doing. Uh, but also along the way, uh, when we first started, it looked like we were going to go off a cliff in terms of our workforce, whereas we're used to cyclical changes in our workforce it, with the looming retirements of the baby boomers, it looked like we were going to have just a d very dramatic drop off in capabilities and, and numbers of people in our workforce and, and we simply weren't going to be able to find the numbers of young people to replace them. Obviously, with the economic downturn, that situation has changed somewhat because a lot of folks, a lot of baby boomers assets significantly shrunk and so a lot of, more of our people than we anticipated are staying on in the workforce for, for a bit longer, which is helping ease that situation. What we thought was going to be a tsunami has not had that effect at all yet, but obviously it's an issue we'll still be facing. So this all uh, presented the question of how can we do a better job of identifying both the numbers and the exact capabilities that we're going to be needing in our workforce. As a result of that issue arising, we created a workforce steering committee at AIA that has been tasked especially with better analysis, better inputs to our annual workforce survey, better analysis of, the, of those inputs and conclusions about what our true workforce needs not just are going to be, not just gross figures and so forth. So um, in, in that vein, I would like to talk about the fact that our, that our industry is really changing. It's always been evolving, but at the present time, it's undergoing some major shifts. And while defense and space sectors, which are heavily reliant on government spending, have recently been retrenching due to deep budget cuts, the commercial air transport sector is rebounding to meet near-term challenge of record production demands. So we see that shift from, away, again, away from defense and back into the civil sector, which is really a cyclical uh, experience in our industry. But at the same time, concepts of security and defense have evolved. So there are now opportunities for cybersecurity, both for the nation and for other industrial sectors. And more and more of our companies are more, becoming more diversified. Even business units within corporations are becoming more diversified in the markets that they're, the, and the technologies that they're pursuing. So in addition to that, everything we make is getting smarter. There's more embedded computers and IT. So that, that part of our workforce is definitely a growing and more significant 
portion. Thus, it came as no surprise that this year on our 2011 workforce survey that we did in conjunction, we do in conjunction with Aviation Week and Space Technology, in every size category of our companies, we break it out by segment so we have better insight into what the real needs are across, across the whole spectrum of our, of our industry. We have le companies that are less than 1,000 people, 1,000 to 5,000, 5,000 to 10,000, and then 10 to, 10 to 50, and above 50. And in every size category, software development is listed as a high demand area for hiring. Software engineering is in high demand for all the companies that are larger than 10,000 employees. And programming is an additional high demand uh, area for companies that are larger than 50,000. Among those, uh, so, so, this year, we estimate that we will be hiring a total of about 32,000 people to fill the positions that are becoming open through retirements and through new jobs. And among those, about 1,300 will be for software development and information technology positions. And we are anticipating a sim similar number of new, new, t new hires excuse me, in software development and information technology annually through 2012, so on the order of 1,100 to 1,300 per year. About 38 percent of the positions for which our industry will be hiring will require security clearances, and other people have talked about that impact, so I won't go into much more than that, but to say that these are jobs that can't be shipped overseas or filled by foreign nationals, and that is true for many of our STEM-related positions. So aerospace and defense are deeply committed to growing an American workforce that we will need to remain viable and thrive in the 21st century global economy. Many of our companies have been and are becoming increasing, increasingly invested in hands-on, project-based, experiential learning programs that are proving effective in engaging students in STEM subjects and inspiring them to undertake STEM careers. Uh, at AIA, we have our signature Team, Remo Team America Robotics Challenge. Many of our companies also support FIRST Robotics. We've heard about that earlier. Uh, a relatively new program that I don't think has been mentioned today is Cyber Patriot, which is a cybersecurity competition for high school students that's offered by the Air Force Association and that Northrop Grumman, again, one of our member companies, is the presenting sponsor for. Boeing, General Dynamics, Raytheon are all strategic partners with that program along with AT. AT&T and, and Microsoft. And Northrop Grumman, I know, is already bringing interns, students who have participated in that program as interns into their workforce. So I just raise those as examples that our companies are engaging uh, with, these, with these various STEM programs to directly impact and attract our workforce. As our companies are taking an increasingly systemic approach to aspire, inspiring, attracting, and preparing our workforce from the earliest stages in their education into the workplace, I expect we will see more IT-related programs of that sort and more competitions and that our companies will be engaged with them because it provides both an opportunity for the students to, to participate in realistic working applications of their learning in real time, and it affords our employees the opportunity to meet those students and serve as role models and mentors and coaches and guidance counselors to help them make the choices that we need them to make to actually enter our workforce. <coughs> so I think that th we are driving more and more of this conversation from the corporate national level where we started five years ago down into the local communities where we think that we can really have an impact. And I'm excited to hear about things that are going on in brilliant Wisconsin and, and other places because I think that's where we all need to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Last but not least, we have Matt to give us the Cisco perspective. Great. I get to do cleanup. I like that. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about something probably a little different than what you've heard. I, I was asked to talk about uh, the role of a corporation in national security. And when, when I was asked that question, I, what immediately came to mind was the series of articles called Top Secret America, you know, these very ominous articles in the Washington Post uh, that were published recently. And there's actually a book by that name if you want to go read it. But, uh, you know, you might you might expect – uh, that somebody from like Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman or Boeing might be uh, sitting here talking about this. And I think, as I thought about how to present this topic, I think in some respects Cisco is, is ideally suited to talk about this because maybe to some of you it's a little unexpected. 
uh, to hear this perspective. Um, you know, when I joined Cisco several years ago, I, I didn't really fully appreciate what Cisco uh, was and what it did. Um, Cisco is, I think, you know, typical of a large IT company, a global multinational corporation. Uh, we have over 70,000 employees. We're located in just about every country on the planet. And the best way for me to sum up what Cisco is and what it does is we, we basically build cyberspace. We build the infrastructure that is cyberspace. If you check the text message, send an email, made a phone call, watched a video, turned on your TV, whatever you did that involves IT and communications, it probably somehow touched Cisco and our technology. Um, so, you know, think of us as, as really a global commercial uh, communications company. Um, we're a provider of capability. We are not a defense contractor. Um, although I'll talk very briefly about the kind of things that we do in the defense space. Um, when, I, when I think about, uh, you know, what's the role of a corporation in, in national security? Um, you know, I, I, I like to think in threes. It must be the Marine Corps training in me. They always teach you to keep it simple when you're in the Marine Corps. You don't want to be too complicated. Marines don't like complicated. Um, but, but really, you know, the, the first one that jumped out at me is, is credibility and have credibility. And I'll talk about that. I'll talk about how to innovate and grow. Uh, partner, and then invest in some, some important technologies that uh, I think uh, uh, are, are critical to U.S. national security um, and also good for business for, for a lot of companies present here in this room. Um, I take a holistic view of, of national security um, and what corporations' role uh, can be. Um, I, I used to support our global government solutions uh, programs, so that was cybersecurity, defense, um, and I now support the emerging markets. And it's given me a totally different perspective on what a company can do as a partner to a Brazil, to a Mexico, to India, um, as, a, as an investor and a partner to create jobs, to bring people up from poverty, to create better stability and economic conditions, and to partner with U.S. government initiatives for global economic development in a way that, that <laughs> lifts all boats globally and creates more stability and, and is in keeping with, with U.S. foreign policy interests. Um, so I think I have a, a, a rather unique perspective uh, on this topic. Um, opportunities. You know, the, w you, you think of a, 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 a corporation in national defense, you probably think of, you know, planes, S uh, satellites, right? Satellites. I've, we worked on satellite projects, military aircraft projects, um, ships, tanks. You know, those are the obvious things to me when you think about the role of a corporation. And, and our system integrators, defense system integrators, are critical to the United States. You know, the, the Department of Defense cannot build an airplane by itself. It must have private corporations that, that, that can do this for it, right? The corporations have to be the place where you've got the, the resident technical knowledge, you've got the, the skill set and experience for system integration, and, and you've got the, you know, hopefully, I think if, if it works well, you've got the, the fiscal discipline to live within a budget and execute a program in, in a timely manner. And those are certainly challenged areas for a lot of large government procurement programs. Um, but businesses are, I think, in some respects uniquely suited to develop those skill sets in their employees. So you know, when I think of corporations, it's not just the technical. It's, it's, the, it's the system integration piece. It's the business sense. It's the ability to pull this all together and deliver the kind of systems that the United States wants to have on behalf of our national security. Um, but it's also other things. It's, it's, it's the power that's powering this building. It's the seaports. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's heavy manufacturing, right? I mean, what do people know around the world about America, right? But Coca-Cola, right? Everywhere you go, people know Coca-Cola is. A lot of people know what General Motors is, right? I mean, the United States as a, as a manufacturing power has, has projected American power through corporations. Um, and it's just a matter of visibility. Uh, but, but what corporations do is provide that critical infrastructure. You know, as you know, uh, critical infrastructure in cybersecurity. 85% of, of the cyber critical infrastructure is owned by private corporations, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, how does the government uh, uh, wrestle with this problem of creating better security when it's not really in their hands in a way that they might might prefer. It's much easier if you own it and you can do whatever you want with it. But in the case of cybersecurity, it's a very complex challenge because it naturally calls for a very deep collaboration between the government and industry to figure out what to do about creating better security in, in what we call cybersecurity. Um, that is an enormously complicated project. I spent several months here at the Wilson Center uh, studying that problem. Um, and, and I'll tell you that I, I, my view is that 
uh, we will see improvements. There's been certainly a lot of emphasis on cybersecurity and cooperation. But I, I, I really, I don't, I mean, you have a very hard job. It, it is a tremendously difficult challenge to herd the cats. We've heard that before. And, you know, some of those cats are industry. How do you herd industry to the place where you want them to go? Okay, how do you do it in a way that is both uh, helpful to industry, doesn't harm economics? I mean, you can't walk two feet in Washington, D.C. these days without hearing people talk about jobs and employment, right? So, you know, that's going to be top of mind, but it's an enormously complicated challenge. And private corporations can and should be willing to step up to the plate and address difficult issues like cybersecurity as a partner to the U.S. government. But, but also from the perspective of a global multinational corporation, from the partner to the government of the United Kingdom. To, as a partner to NATO, as a partner to Australia and Japan and the allies of the United States and our, our global friends and partners. Um, and, and I also want to talk very briefly about uh, 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 some, of the, some of the challenges, I think, uh, that, that we have uh, in, in this space. Um, it is very difficult for a global multinational corporation like Cisco. We're very open internally. We value collaboration. Um, you've heard about security clearances and U.S.-only access. And, and in the programs where we need that, we have that. But we have to build that infrastructure in place. And, and for us, it's a cost of doing business, right? If we want to be in that game, if we want to be in cybersecurity, if we want to be in satellite, then we have to make those investments because it makes good sense for us. And we do. Um, but, but it, is, it, it never goes away. I, I am the, uh, the compliance official for the ITAR in Cisco. Um, and, and, you know, I have the same conversation over and over again with, with my clients in the company uh, who just, they just want to collaborate. They just want to work together. They just want to solve problems. Um, your average engineer is you know, very smart. They're not trying to break the law. They just want to solve a problem. And when you tell them that, no, you can't go call that person in Australia who holds the keys to that answer, we have to stop and wait. We have to go file a license. We have to consider whether or not we've got an export issue. It's enormously frustrating for the culture of a corporation like Cisco. Um, in cybersecurity, this year the, the government uh, released its, uh, its vision for international cooperation on cybersecurity. And, and when I read the document, one of the first things that jumps to mind is it never really mentions export controls. Because with respect to cybersecurity and global cooperation, you know, a lot of the controls revolve around encryption technology. And if we're working with a company, say, say you're working with the United Kingdom, a very close ally, side by side on the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan. We're developing fighter aircraft together in the same environment. This is the closest global partner we have. Um, yet if we want to talk about national crypto, if we want to talk about sensitive cryptography, you know, we have to stop. We have to consider, do we have a licensing issue? Do we have to go get it? And I don't make these comments to just complain about the law, right? Because these laws make sense, frankly. Okay, from, from even from my industry perspective, they make sense. Um, but, but what we do need, I think, and what we are getting, luckily, uh, today in the Obama administration is, is enhancements and improvements that I think will make this easier. But I'm just pointing this out to sort of discuss how, how difficult it is for a, a global multinational to try and use its global workforce. We have an enormous investment in India. We're making enormous investments in places like Brazil, China, Russia. How do we harness all these resources for things like solving the problems of cybersecurity? Clean energy, okay? Smart and connected cities. How do we connect all these devices that we all have? And, and, and every device to a car, to a satellite, to an aircraft. We had a partner that came to us and they had a vision for black box being broadcast up through a, a satellite or a UAV. Okay, it's a brilliant idea, but it runs smack into export controls. And it's the most obvious, and, and, and it makes perfect sense to say, why is it in the airplane? Why isn't it broadcasted out? Why isn't it in a place where I can get it with a couple of keystrokes, right? It's a great idea, but it, it runs into these impediments. And, and these are the kind of challenges that, that we face. Um, and, and all Microsoft faces it, Oracle faces it, Lockheed Martin faces it. We all face it. Um, you know, I think one of the great stories uh, in the challenges that we have today, cybersecurity, clean energy, um, streamlining of, of procurement, government procurement, efficiencies, is that there are win-wins all over the place, frankly. Um, cybersecurity can be a win-win for the government and for industry. We all need it. It's not like one of us can have it and the other one can't, okay? This is something we can do together. Clean energy is another area where, where there are a lot of win-wins for the government and industry, and it's in the national security interest of the United States for us all to work together. Um, so I would encourage you to think of, and I think Cisco tries to think of itself as, as a partner uh, to government interests related to national security, whether it's 
purely defense, uh, building a satellite system, or whether it's something like trying to help help a developing country uh, manage its power grid in a way that pollutes significantly less than it does today because that pollution is going to cross borders and affect all of us. Um, I'm, I'm going to be brief because I know we're short on time, um, but, but uh, I just kind of want to leave you with the idea that, uh, you know, I, I think corporations of all kinds uh, play a critical role in American national security. Um, it's incumbent on us as the corporate entity to be transparent with the U.S. government, okay, to share what we can do to be transparent about our global activities with the government. And I can tell you that Cisco is very focused on transparency and partnering with the U.S. government on national security issues, um, but also balancing our, our, our views of our, of our global partners, right? So when we invest in a country like Brazil, you know, we, we, have to, we have to be a good partner to the country of Brazil as well. But we're always mindful, I think, as U.S. companies always are, of, of where we're from. Um, and what our interests are. So uh, I'll, I'll summarize with that because I, I know it's been a long morning. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> we, we are running very short on time, but I don't want to deny people the opportunity to ask a question or two. So if we have a couple of quick questions, um, we'll entertain them um, for the panel here. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. You could just wait for a microphone. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Fred Altman. And I'm wondering, in terms of security clearances, is there data that all the things that are required are really necessary, or that there are other things that may be necessary that are not included? Um, the, that's a, that's a growing, uh, an interesting question. Yesterday, uh, at a DOD-sponsored uh, session with Representative Langevin from uh, Rhode Island, that topic came up. And I think we're still struggling with how do we kind of resolve those requirements? How do we expedite? How do we look closer at a person who perhaps was, is a first generation American and, uh, or uh, is a naturalized citizen and expedite that process? And right now, it's still, we're still holding on to our old traditional ways of doing it. But I think we're going to soon realize that we need to maybe relook at this whole situation. And that was kind of the outcome of that entire thing. 17-year-olds who are going for an internship at a laboratory have to get a full security clearance in many places. Which, same forms that all of us who work for the feds had to fill out and go through. Lovely um, SF-86. Second question. <laughs> Let me pose one for everyone maybe in closing. Um, it, we're going into a tight, very tight budget environment where we're likely to see major cuts in federal spending, both on the civilian and the defense side. And the question for each of the panels, panelists from your own perspective, either as being in the government, um, how will that impact spending that directly funds STEM programs and activities? And also, how will that impact both at the companies that support the government and the government itself, how will that impact the ability to hire, develop, nurture, and you know, attract the next generation workforce? We've had some cyclical things happening in the past, and Laura, maybe you want to lead us off. I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about those issues. Oh, thanks, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, this is uh, clearly going to be hard times, and if you just look at the past behavior, right? <laughs> The first three things that go, education, training, and travel, right? Cross the board. I don't care if it's industry or government, whatever. And that is the tendency. How can we stop ourselves from doing that? I mean, we, uh, so this is where the STEM executive board actually at the department is going to be struggling with. And it is. How do you change, you know, your past behavior uh, and instead think about, all right, instead of getting, you know, simpler, life is getting more complicated. And so we really do. This is a national asset in my mind, right? And unless we start thinking about that uh, and we start eating our seed corn like we've had, you know, done in other times, uh, it's the we will never, never, never uh, be secure in many ways, right? So, no, it's a, it's a real struggle and it's going to take real leadership in my mind. 
I would answer from two different perspectives or standpoints. On the one hand, I can tell you that at AIA we have kind of a creative tension because on the one hand we have a group of people working on the whole industrial base issue and what what is the work that we're going to have and arguing we need to have a certain amount of work to be able to attract and retain the workforce we need. The, on the other side of the house are people like me who are saying we have a crisis because we don't have enough young people studying math and science. So frankly, we're working on rationalizing all of that by getting more insight and fidelity into what the true workforce needs will be. And obviously that's somewhat dependent upon what the budget's gonna look like. So I talked about dramatic shifts. We know they're happening. We don't know exactly what that's going to be yet. In terms of spending on education and how our companies support it, I will say that all along the, our companies have been telling us there won't be more money. It'll just be money that we're going to have to spend different, smarter, and, and things we're going to have to do differently. So it, that is only underlined by the fact that the budgets are shrinking. And so it's a, it's a problem we recognize, but, uh, or a constraint we recognize, but it's going to be even stricter. Yeah, I, I could just, uh, I mean, in, in Cisco, you know, you may have seen in the news we just, we had a restructuring. Um, and, and, you know, those are difficult times in a corporation, but coming out of that, you know, there's a real emphasis on, on investment and development. Um, we, we just, uh, we have all these great training programs in Cisco, um, but, but each department has billed a lot of money for each one, so it becomes prohibitive. So, you know, when you want to go take a three or $4,000 course that makes perfect sense for what you do, you know, it's, it becomes a budgetary issue. Well, the company just centralized all that. So now you can just take the training, right? They want it, they're trying to make it easier for program managers, for employees to take the training they need without sitting back and going, do we have enough money in our budget now? So they, the company is, is, and I think a lot of companies are doing this because we recognize that you have to invest in the people you have, okay? If you sit on your hands, the, you, you'll only backslide. So uh, despite the constraints, um, you know, there's a real emphasis on, okay, now we, we've done the hard part. The painful part is over. We must grow. We must invest in the people we have. We must execute what we need to do and grow. And I think you probably find that's pretty, that's not a novelty to Cisco. I think that's probably true across the board. I would, I would just take a second to share some good news stories that, <coughs> that exist out there. First of all, my office is the only office in the National Cybersecurity Directorate that got a plus up this year. <laughs> So that's good news. So Secretary Napolitano, uh, she's realizing the importance of this. But on the other side of the house, we understand what the problems with the federal government are in education and, and the cuts and stuff. So what we're starting to do is going out and looking at where industry is actually stepping up to the plate, as was just described here, and making a solid investment in their community. And also then taking a step back for, and let's just take this from the IT approach. I've come to the conclusion of being in this business for about 10 plus years now that we don't necessarily need bachelor trained people to do every single job in IT. We need some quick technical training, community college level, associate level training. Well, uh, I'll, I'll give you one example, and you guys can use this as a model. Alamo Community Colleges in San Antonio, Texas, have partnered with Lockheed Martin and other key aerospace-type industries down at the Port of San Antonio, and they are paying for high school seniors to go to the community college to get their C++ certificates, their CISSPs, those types of formal, those certi certifications, they're interning them in the summer and evaluating them, then hiring them back and, and or paying them about, it comes up to about $8,500 worth of scholarship money to finish their education and get their job. And then later on, after a couple of years of working as they want to move up, then they're sending them to school companies are to pay for that. And that's, a, that's just an awesome way of doing things because Industry is the leading edge. We in the government, we're way behind the power curve. <laughs> I mean, we all know that. So, you know, great or companies like Cisco, Lockheed Martin, uh, that's what we got we to leverage. They're smart enough to figure this out, and the rest of the whole country is going to benefit out of the whole thing. So all right. so Thanks so much. I'm sorry we're out of time. And um, join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Let me hear. And yeah, our, our lady, our chief security officer, is naval officer, former naval officer. Uh, don't. Yeah. yeah. We're rip-roaring ready to go. Good, good. Yeah. Yeah. So. Can I have a new cyber security tech person coming? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. I'm asking you, where were you? Where Yeah. All right. Get a whip in the chair. I know. I was gonna, that was my first question. Daphne. Got it. Long morning, huh? Yeah. I'm going to be really brief, honestly. Yeah. The nose is growing in front of me. No, no, no. Seriously, because I don't have that much to say. So. Right now, I'm living in a Microsoft Excel project. But I, my life wouldn't be possible without it. Yeah, so. I just want to grab it. <laughs> sure, thank you. Yeah. Tony Fowler. Nice to meet you. Good afternoon. And it is now afternoon, so I can officially say that. Um, my name is Bill Camell. I work for that small software company out of Redmond, Washington. <laughs> um, it's 